Would you open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5? Ephesians chapter 5. We're in a series called The Family of God. We're in Ephesians chapter 5. We've been going through the book of Ephesians chapter by chapter. We are in chapter 5. We're going to be talking about the family of God. And we're going to be talking about your family. So let's just jump right into it and get, get going and see what all of it has to say. And I want to start at what I consider to be one of the top 10, top 10 most misunderstood Bible verses. Can I start there? I, I would put this in the top 10. And, and I would put this century after century, you know, generation after generation, where people have misunderstood this Bible verse, and it's extremely plain and simple if you would look at it. And I have seen gross, gross misunderstandings to the point of a certain class of people being put, made slaves versus free. Christ is about freedom, not about slavery. So let's begin Ephesians chapter 5. In the middle of the chapter, let's introduce the, one of the top 10 most misunderstood Bible verses, and then we'll jump back to chapter to verse 1. And in chapter 5, verse 22, it says this, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Well, verse 22 and verse 23, especially 22, I believe fits in the category of the top 10 misunderstood Bible verses in the whole Bible. And I have seen whole denominations put women into slavery or servitude because of this. I have seen women think that they have to stay in a horrible relationship where they are physically beaten because of this Bible verse. Because they don't understand what this verse is saying. I have seen men say, hey, shut up. I'm, the, I'm in charge. I've seen all kinds of abuse. And that is not what this is communicating. If we remember, what is the gospel? The gospel is about freedom, not slavery. The gospel is about people being set free, not be, being people put under slavery. So in order for us to get there next week... And completely understand that next Sunday, we got to go through the first part of this chapter and understand everything that he's saying. Now, I would like you to think about this for a moment. Just pretend. I need you to back up in your mind. It's rewinding, you know, the, and I, I've come up on the stage. Furthermore, I would like to clarify something that I said. If that was the very first thing that came out of my mouth, what would you think? What? Did I miss something? Did he say something else? Look at verse 1 of chapter 5. The very first word, therefore, or furthermore. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Why did the people decide to put the chapter there? Now, you understand when Paul wrote the letter of Ephesians, it was a letter. It was an open, lengthy letter to a city. And this city was known for its miraculous power of the Holy Spirit operating in the church. There were great miracles and signs and wonders taking place in the city of Ephesus. These people were strong in the power of the presence of God, and they had begun their entire ministry with the love of Christ and the love of people and helping people be set free. This is the city that took all their witchcraft books, sorcery books, and satanic worship and burned it. This is the city that when they went out for Jesus, they went all out. So now, for Paul to write to them this letter, this, this lengthy letter, we have, other people have, editors at one time in history, chopped up the different letters that Paul wrote and the different books that the prophets wrote and the different books that Moses wrote and put chapters and verses for the purpose of us being able to locate certain things easily. Paul did not write that way. Paul did not write chapter 1, verse 1. Paul just wrote. So someone decided in the middle of a thought to put a break and call it chapter 5. We read and assume there's an automatic break. In fact, 
the editor of this particular Bible went even further than that and started putting titles above certain sections that we had called breathers, and they put titles. And some of the titles are their opinion of what is being said, and it can influence you versus just reading the letter. And if we just read the letter, we would realize Paul's in the middle of a thought that he is now bringing some more to what he had just said. The word therefore in the book of Ephesians is found, I believe, more than 16 times. Paul is lengthy. Therefore, therefore, <laughs> therefore. And it was like in the book of Ephesians, it's one of Paul's favorite words. In order, whenever you find the word therefore in any of the writings of Paul and, and of John and of James, when you see the word therefore, you must, you are required to look above that word and find the concept or the thought that he's communicating and then link it to the one down below. More than 90% of the time, what you're going to have is a statement being made or a condition being declared or uh, some spiritual truth. And now with that, therefore, because of what I just said, this can happen. And if we do not connect it like that, we can get into misunderstanding and even wrong doctrine. And the doctrine that is wrong in Ephesians chapter 5 is this doctrine that a woman or a wife is a servant of the husband. It has been so wrong that I've seen denominations get so carried away with it that women can't even talk in church. We'll take another Bible verse that talks about women to be silent in the church. Think about that. Can I just jump over there? And what, can we jump over there? Think about this. There is a Bible verse in, 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 where Paul writes to the church of Corinth. And he says that women should not speak in church. And so what we've done, we took a doctrine and said, all women can't talk. You know, if they, and, and, now follow what Paul says, that a woman should keep silent in the church. She should ask her husband. What if you don't have a husband? So obviously, it was talking about a group of women, wives. That's, obviously, it wasn't talking about all women, because not all women have a husband. In the Greek, the word for, for woman does not clarify at all whether she is married or not married. It doesn't, just, it doesn't allow us to know, is he talking to a married woman or a non-married woman? Is he talking to a widow? Or is he talking to someone who's not even old enough to be married, but is a teenager? So we have to clarify that with the doctrine or the, the chapter that you're reading, and I want to do that here. I would like to set you free because you will know the truth. And the truth sets you free. I would like you to fully understand what Paul was saying to wives. I would like to clarify the marriage flow and the system so that there is full freedom and not slavery. But we have been set free by Jesus Christ. Do I have your interest? We will talk about part of it today and wrap it up next Sunday. You, yeah, it's a, it's a two-parter. Now, if we are at verse 1, of chapter 5, and we see the word therefore, we have to back up and find out what was he talking about. But that leads me to chapter 4, verse 25. And there is the word therefore again. Do you see that? In fact, um, you will find that in chapter 4, he uses the word therefore a couple of times, and we find ourselves all the way at verse 17. He says, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should not you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the fertility of their mind. Paul starts a dissertation or a talk. He starts a talk on, you should be different than the world. And he starts in chapter 4. He said there should be a difference between you and the world. There should be a difference, and now he wants to talk about the difference. Is the difference in clothing, hairstyle, or any of those things? No. He said, but the difference needs to be the new man, that we need to be able to put on the new man. People should be able to see that you are different, that you have a different 
way of approaching life and that you have different viewpoints of life. They should be able to see Christ in you. And he begins in verse 17. Then he gets to verse 25. Therefore, when he talks about let's put off the old man, let's put on the new man it, above verse 25, he gets to verse 25. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry. And his neighbor that he's referring to is classified and, and qualified as your other fellow believers. These are people attending your church. Now, Paul is not saying that you are a brother of a non-believer. You are a brother or sister of a believer. And he's talking about us working together. Therefore, putting away lying. And he's telling Christians. He's telling born-again Christians. Stop lying. Don't lie anymore. And you may be thinking, Christians actually lie? Oh, man, they got some buttes. <laughs> Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. This is other Christians. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. We talked about that last week. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no more. Christians quit stealing. Let, whom, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, labor. Let's pause right there. I would like to talk about labor for one moment. Today is Veterans Day, today. Most people are celebrating it tomorrow. Schools are off tomorrow. Banks are closed tomorrow. But today is actually Veterans Day. This is the day we say we'll never forget. This is the day we say thank you for being and serving our country. So if you are a veteran, would you stand, please? I am one. I served four years in the United States Army, so I'm standing. <laughs> so we're going to say to the man, we're going to say, stay standing, stay standing. We just want to bless you. We want to say thank you for your service. Thank you for what you've done, and we have not forgotten we thank every single one of you, and I can look at, at some of you, and I can tell you were probably right around there with me and at the Vietnam time. I, I, by the grace of God, didn't go to Vietnam, missed it by 30 days, but that's okay with me. But you that have served in the different military services, we thank you, and Father, we ask that you bless their labor of love. Amen. Their labor of love. Amen? Amen. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> it says, verse 28, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt co word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. So here Paul starts rattling down this list, and he says, here's a way to behave. He goes, Quit lying to each other. Quit having corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Quit having corrupt words proceed from your mouth. These are words that are destroying people, destroying their heart, destroying their hope, destroying their vision, destroying their dreams. Don't go around crushing people's dreams. When someone tells you a dream, just say, dream on. Keep going. Don't say, oh, how's that ever going to happen? Well, it's not going to happen with you. <laughs> but you could be one that helps it get moved forward by just being a cheerleader. God says, just be a cheerleader for other people's dreams. Don't go to people and crush them. Don't tell them they, they can't succeed. Don't tell them that they're the wrong age, they're the wrong color of skin, that they're the wrong whatever. You just tell them, you live your dream. Live your dream. Don't give up on it. Verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom we were sealed on the day of redemption. We talked about that last, last week. Now let's look at verse 31, 32, and go right into chapter 5. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another. This is how you're supposed to treat other Christians. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Someone may say this, well, shouldn't we also treat non-Christians this way? Yes, but in the writing of the context that we are reading, Paul is talking about how do you treat each other right now. If we start treating each other that way, it'll be easier to treat other people that way too. Let's practice on each other. If we can't do it to the brother that loves the Lord as well, how are we going to do it outside? 
So when we come on church property, let's, let's do these things so we can take it off church property and also do those things. So he says in verse 32, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. There are people who, who get hurt. They get hurt and they don't forgive. I remember as a young pastor, I was, you know, I was a brand new pastor, only a couple of years, and this man, he came to me and he goes, I, I need your help in my, in my marriage. It's really horrible. It's just miserable. He told me how miserable it was, and here's, here's what he said. He goes, um, before I was a Christian, I cheated on my wife, and she didn't know about it. Then I became a Christian. And I've been a Christian about five years, and I just felt like it was wrong that she didn't know. So I went to her and told her. And that's where it all started. And she had lots of emotional reactions. I'm talking to the two of them four years after the event. So he's been a Christian for five years, told her. Four years later, she's a Christian, now nine years. She's been a Christian before him. She prayed him into the kingdom. Do you see the mess that we have? I'm now talking to her, and here's what her words are. I have forgiven him, but I will never let him forget it. Okay, how's that going to promote a healthy life. And do you, do you actually believe she forgave him? No. no, that's the issue. The reason she can't forget it is she can't forgive. And until she forgives, she will not forget. And so it, life at that home was miserable. Why? Because he just felt like I needed to tell her. You know, I had all kinds of thoughts. Why'd you tell her? Why'd you just tell me? You know, we could have walked through this in a process. We could have let it out easily. I mean, we could have figured it out. And what it came down to is the reason he wanted to tell her is he felt guilty. Now, telling her, you know, we can't get into that right now. I want to get into this because that's a whole thing. Here's, here's what it says in verse 32. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. When a Christian does something wrong and God they ask for forgiveness and there's repentance and you, God is asking you to forgive them. We have a couple of things. One, when they ask for forgiveness, you're supposed to forgive them right away. Two, you're also taught by Jesus Christ to forgive them before they even ask. We are, and how can I forgive someone who greatly hurts me, who tremendously, tremendously wounded me emotionally? Emotional hurt is far deeper and harder to overcome than physical hurt. Emotional hurt is, is something different. The way you get, when you find yourself very difficult for you to be able to achieve a forgiveness from emotional hurt, is you must now meditate on how much you were forgiven. The power to forgive will come to you by you meditating and thinking about the power that you received in forgiveness from Christ. How much did God forgive you? How much has he forgiven you? As I think about that, and he asked me to forgive another person even as God in Christ forgave me. There's where I'm able to go. And now, if I will walk in an attitude of forgiveness, I will now be more Christ-like. Therefore, verse 1, chapter 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. How am I supposed to imitate God? Freely giving out forgiveness. That's a, that's a God imitator. Freely giving it out. How did you get forgiven? Freely. No strings attached. All by grace. I take that same grace that God gave me and I give it to others. Now you must understand, okay? Listen closely. Forgiveness, reconciliation, recompense, and trust are all separate steps. You can forgive instantly, but it doesn't mean that you must trust instantly. Trust and forgiveness are two separate things, completely. 
But we are commanded to forgive. We are not commanded to trust. We must trust within our own experience. And we must have a time of it being proven that I can give out more trust. And if someone hurts you, you can forgive them. But you can also say, you know, I'm I'm just going to be cautious on how we move forward because I'm not right now completely trusting everything that you say. You with me on all this? Okay. Now, doing that, let's go on to verse 1, chapter 5 again. Therefore, therefore be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love. As Christ also has loved us, forgiven himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. It goes, now we are supposed to be Christ-like. We're supposed to be God imitators. We are supposed to be now moving on with with the Lord. We are supposed to be um, walking like Christ, walking like God. Look at verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness Let it not even be named among you as it is fitting for saints. Now, verses 1 through 6, he tells you a life that you shouldn't do. And he kind of repeats some from the chapter 4. Then he goes on to verse 4. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which um, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. He said, as a Christian... You should not be standing around with other people sharing dirty jokes, filthy jokes, coarse jesting. You should not be um, participating in language that is going to be detrimental, destructive to other people. I mean, that's what he's saying. This is Christianity 101. And he wrote the letter to a church that was thriving and had tens of thousands of people and they were moving in the spirit and they had burned witchcraft books and they had repented from uh, evil ways and they're following God and he tells them, stop with your dirty jokes. Stop with your filthy mouth. Stop with your language. Don't try to prove how much you are like the world by talking like the world. He says, one area that you can change is how you talk. He doesn't address their dress. He doesn't talk about their their hairstyle. He doesn't talk about what purse to buy, what purse not to buy, or anything like that. He talks about their mouth. How you talk to people and how you communicate. This is what he says. Some of you are just enjoying this completely. It could change your conversation on the freeway. Okay, let's read verse 4 again. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but the rather of giving thanks. When you feel like you want to cuss somebody out, and the words begin to come out of your mouth, change them to praise. Just start praising God. Some of you are looking at me like I just removed one-third of your vocabulary. (laughs) It says in verse 5, For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, clarified in the Greek, classifying as an idolater, which means he doesn't believe in God, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. He did not say that your behavior took away your place in the kingdom. He says you are aware no person that's an idolater, which is a classification of a non-believer, has any inheritance with God. So he said, so don't act like one. He said, if you are a Christian, it's okay to be different in your behavior, in your speech. And he's communicating all about speech and treating of other people. We should be the example of kindness. We should be the example of saying good words. We should be the example of helping people be built up and and have hope. We should not be tearing down our own and tearing down the army of God with words that come out of our mouth. Verse 6, 
Let no one deceive you with empty words. But because of these things, the wrath of God comes uh, upon the sons of disobedience. And then he clarifies it again. The sons of disobedience is a term that Paul has used several times in different places of classifying people who do not believe in God. He said, so let's don't behave like them. Let's don't talk like them. Let's be different. And how, Paul, are we to be different? Be different in your behavior towards one another and what you say. And the world will see it. And then he goes into verse 8. For where... For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. He says, now walk in it. You used to be darkness. Now you are called to behave in a different way. How? Through kindness. Through generosity. Through respect. And that's what we are being told to do. This is part of our Christ behavior. This is good preaching, better than you guys are responding. You guys just... <laughs> verse, um, verse 10. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. In other words, search for the God's will for your life and live it. And that makes you different. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Oh, is this verse also... This verse is in the top 12. Not the top 10, but the top 12. Here's how people read this. Let me read it, and then I'll tell you the, what, how people look at it. Verse 11 again. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Here's how people read those Bible verses. It is my job as a Christian to go around and find other people's faults and, sh and bring it out and expose it and show it. That is not at all what Paul's saying. Paul is not saying that you need to go out. In fact, he even says in the one verse, it's shameful to even talk about it. So why are you talking about it? By pointing at it. He says the way that you expose it is by turning the light on. Because light exposes all darkness. And by you being who you're supposed to be, your presence of light in Christ exposes the darkness that the world's involved in. And they see their exposure. You don't need to point it out. Look at it again. Some of you are going, I'm not sure what you're talking about. I'm thinking about In-N-Out Burger right now. <laughs> Look at it again in verse 11. Have no fellowship, no jo joint participation is what the Greek word means, with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Dark and light is going to be the issue here. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. So why would you want to go talk about them if it's shameful to speak about them? And he says here in verse 13, But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. And he's talking about those who are dead are the people that are participating in the darkness. And those people who are light are the people participating in the light. And the light has been clarified in all the verses we've already read this morning. And that is behavior that watches what you say and watches how you treat people. And if you will treat people with kindness and say kind words and, and you will be in, encouraging in your conversation and you're not participating in filth, filthy communication, you are exposing what's going on. Your light has put light on the darkness and the people in darkness now see the contrast, the difference between you and them and it leads people to the Lord and sows seeds in their life. You're watering the harvest by being Christ-like. Verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly. In other words, just, let's just do this on purpose. Not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand 
what the will of the Lord is. You need to understand, he's going to tell you to do two things. Understand what the will of the Lord is in every situation you are. How can I speak words of life to this darkness? And those words of life will be the light that exposes the darkness. You have never helped anybody by going to them and said, you're a sinner going to hell. They're just behaving the way they are. I mean, how do you go to a dog and say, you know, you shouldn't act like a dog because you're barking? Dogs bark, right? Cats meow. Isn't that part of being a dog? A sinner sins. Your goal isn't to get them to stop sinning. Your goal is to show them there's another way of life and there's light that you can have and that is for you to be light for them. Look at verse 18. It's going, to get, it's going to get even more fun right now. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dis, dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Paul connects the filling of the Spirit as a better experience than being drunk with wine. Paul does not say not to drink wine, he says not to be drunk. When it comes to understanding anything that has to do with alcohol in the Bible, the, al the Bible is never against alcohol, never against wine. And in fact, you can thank the, the monks for beer. <laughs> beer was created by a whole bunch of monks, uh, religious people. But what it does say is you never are to be drunk. So if you wake up with a hangover, then you are drunk. And some people can get drunk without being waking up with a hangover, without having a hangover. But the Bible is clear. We're not supposed to get drunk. We're not supposed to lose our ability to know what's going on. And it says here that you are supposed to be filled with the Spirit. In other words, there should be a desire to be filled with the Spirit, and the experience of being filled with the Spirit is more fun and more fulfilling than being filled with wine. And Paul says that we should all be filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit. What in the world does that mean? Paul talks about it a lot, and the Bible communicates it clearly. That is the infilling of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit himself fills your very presence, and he even gives you a language to communicate and to speak, called a heavenly language. And he's saying to all of us, you should not be drunk with wine, but you should be filled with the Spirit. Then he says, when you're filled with the Spirit, you should be speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. We should be inside happy people. Yes. And the way you become happy people is that you decide to be Christ-like and be filled with the Spirit. The filling with the Spirit should be what I drive myself to for answers, not to alcohol. I should not relieve the pain of life through wine. I should relieve the pain of life through the Spirit. And you know how some people, when they get a little, they, they, they drink a tiny bit too much, they get all giggly and a little happy. And da, 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 da. Uh, they're just imitating them being filled with the Holy Spirit. He says you can do that without wine. You can do it with the Spirit and making melody and, and songs in your heart to the Lord. To the Lord, just thanking God for life. Just thanking God that you are alive. Just thanking God that he has given you life and that everything is working inside you. Let's, then we go over here to verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Men submitting to one another. Women submitting to one another. Family submitting to one another in the fear of 
God. Now think about this. If I take this chapter and this thought process that Paul is going, and he's communicating this thought, 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 and Paul virtually communicates this. Don't behave like the world that is domineering to follow the flesh. Behave like Christ, which is walking in the love of God. Walk in the presence and, the, and be filled with the Spirit. Follow after God. Make melody inside your heart. Submitting to everyone in the fear of God, which means, God, I want your plan. Wives, submit to your husband, who's filled with the Spirit. Make a melody in his heart. Not following the world, but following Christ. Wives, submit to your husband as the church to the Lord. Totally different. We are talking about a family unit pressing in towards the things of God. We're talking about the family unit saying, God, what is your will? We're talking about the family unit being filled with the Spirit. We're talking about the family unit submitting to one another. We're talking about walking in the fear of God. And then he says, wives, submit to, one, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. Also, Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. We are submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. And God says, I have made a chain of command. And he has chosen the chain of command to be the husband, the wife, and the children. And that chain of command and the submission to it is the submission to the plan of God and the way of God. It doesn't mean that the wife is a servant to the husband. It doesn't mean that the husband is a lord of the wife. It means that we have a family unit and there's going to be one head and we're going to move together in the fear of God and we're going to follow the plan of God and we're going to seek the will of God. It doesn't mean that the man does everything. It doesn't mean that the man runs the money. It doesn't mean that the man tells the wife what to do. It doesn't mean that the wife, you know, has to be a slave at home and do everything that he commands. It's not it at all. How do you get any of that from the previous verses above it? How do you get any of that if we are told not to have filthy conversation, coarse jesting? How do we get any of that when we are told to be Christ-like and that it's okay to be different from the rest of the world? How do we get any of that conversation or doctrine if we read the chapter in front of it? And the chapter in front of it is to walk in light as he, we are in the light. And we're supposed to expose darkness. And how do we expose darkness? We're supposed to be Christ-like. And if the husband is going to be the head, then we would like the husband. We would like him to be an example of spiritual strength and spiritual fortitude and spiritual life and light. We do not want the husband to be this authoritative individual that's commanding the rest of the family to be their, his particular kingdom and slave so that he can come home, sit down in the chair, pop open his beer, and yell, when's dinner ready? <laughs> Women are really quiet, right? Those are all men that responded. <laughs> Women aren't saying anything. Christ came to liberate and set free, not to make slaves. That is the gospel message. And he says here that we are supposed to submit one to another. Now, what in the world does it mean for the woman to treat her husband as Lord? What in the world does it mean I'm supposed to submit to him as to the Lord and the husband is my head. What does that mean? That's next Sunday. Yeah. Let's, let's close our Bibles. Turn off our devices. Next Sunday, we'll finish the chapter. We'll talk to you about the family unit. The husband, the wife, the kids. Then it goes right into chapter 6, which again is a horrible place that they put that that chapter title because it goes into children so we'll talk about husbands wives 
children and how they are, how you're supposed to treat each other in that family unit and why that family unit can be extremely powerful spiritually. Now, I'm quite aware there are certain cultures, certain cultures, and this is not any kind of, this is an observation of history. There are certain cultures where the man is exalted much higher than the woman. And when when I lived in South Korea, I lived in South Korea for a year when I was in the military. And when I would go to Seoul, Korea, and I would be walking around uh, Seoul, Korea, I I found, and I found it also even in the farm areas, because I actually lived on a farm, a rice paddy. It's it's a farm. They farmed rice. (laughs) But, um, but I found that in that culture, when I lived in South Korea, I found in that culture that the man is the head to the point that the woman walks a few steps behind him when they're walking in public. Okay, that, and then someone will say, well, that's the culture, and shouldn't that culture also be in the church? No, here's the difference. We're not asked to walk like the world. We're asked to walk like Christ. Christ is the one that picked up the woman caught in the act of adultery and said, you're forgiven. He's the one that went to the woman at the well and shared the gospel with her. He's the one that liberated women. And so if I'm going to follow Ephesians chapter 5, I'm not going to follow my culture. I'm going to follow my family. And my family is the family of God. And there's a big difference. I have been redeemed from my culture and I have been brought into the family of God. So there are things that get settled because I'm in the family. Amen? Amen. Did you learn something today? Can we give the Lord a hand? Just thank you. I don't like ending uh, a message or talk on Sunday or, or Sunday service without giving you the opportunity to come into the family of God. Bible says this that God made man and out of man came the first woman Eve Adam and Eve committed sin against God when they did they took the entire human race and brought them into a destiny of separation for eternity from God and when they die physically they end up going to hell the entire human race is going to hell God says, I need to take care of that. And he sends his son to die on the cross. And when Jesus dies on the cross, God opens the door for anyone in the family of Adam to leave that family and come to God's family if they ask for help. You can ask for help by saying, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, save me. Jesus, help me. Jesus, you are the son of God be my Lord, whatever terms you want to use, whatever conversation you want, it doesn't matter. But if you are destined for hell and you reach up and grab the hand of God who is wanting you to come into his family, you have an opportunity to leave the family of the world and come into the family of God by simply a request. God does not send anyone to hell. They're already going He rescues them from hell into heaven. If you would like to be rescued, today's the day to do it. If you would like to have Jesus be your Lord, today is the day to do it. Here's how we're going to do it. And where I'm going to ask in just a second, just a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to bow their head and close their eyes and have a time of prayer. At this time, Mark's going to be playing the keyboard. And you have an opportunity on your own, in your mind, in your heart, to talk to Jesus. And say, Jesus, I need you. Whatever words you want to use. And when you do, Jesus is going to say yes. Because the Bible says, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So would you bow your head? Would you close your eyes? If you've never asked Jesus into your heart, if you've never asked him into your life, would you do that right now?